morning. Good morning. Welcome to church on this beautiful fall Sunday morning. And I trust you've come with a heart that's ready to worship the Lord and receive truth from His Word and, and hear what He has to say to you, follow His leadership. We're going to begin the service with our announcements, and so I want to just uh, just keep you apprised of a few things. First of all, I do want to say a big thank you to Kevin Peck for all of your hard work on the roof. Uh, if you've noticed, maybe it's a little bit brighter in here. That we've had that uh, skylight covered over as they've been working. And uh, so, so we get a little sunlight in now, which is great. Uh, but, uh, but Kevin was sealing up those beams, um, and that's a... Uh, to help with, with some of the, the water runoff problems we've been having. And so big thank you to Kevin for all your hard work, and uh, we really, really appreciate it. Uh, also, wanted to uh, let you know, uh, Pastor Brian just got married uh, yesterday, and so uh, we'll make sure that we congratulate him in person, he and his new bride, Maria. When they get back in town, they'll be here next Sunday, Lord willing, is the plan. And so, uh, uh, but stay tuned, we'll probably be trying to uh, schedule some sort of a, a wedding shower for them. We don't have any details there, but uh, stay tuned on that. Uh, but we're going to grow the church one way or another. Uh, we're going to get uh, married people, uh, you know, have babies. Well, that's the way, you've got to grow it. And, um, and so uh, we're, we're really excited for them and excited for uh, Maria Robleno uh, to join uh, our, our church as well. Um, also, uh, November 2nd will be the... the, the Chili, the soup feed, the bake auction at uh, the school, and it starts at 4 p.m. The auction starts at 6. The, the, the eating is at 4, and the auction starts at 6. And so keep that in mind. You don't want to miss that wonderful opportunity to go and have a lot of fun, but also support the school, the ministry of the school. You have an, uh, a, an announcement in your bulletin, and there's been, it's incorrect, November 9th, uh, church fall party at Brennan and Rita's. Um, that is not going to work out because of some, uh, some conflict. And so we, we're still working together to find uh, a replacement date on that. Stay tuned on that as well. But it will not be on the night. So just keep that in mind. November the 10th will be the international dinner. We have that every year. And uh, bring your favorite ethnic dishes and desserts. We've had all kinds of things. We've had Mexican food. We've had Jamaican food. We've had German dishes. We've had all kinds of dishes. And um, that's always a, a fun Sunday. And a free will donation is accepted. And what is that uh, donation uh, for this year? It's for the, I thought so, I want to make sure, uh, it's, it's, support, it's support of the Lesotho missions uh, trip, the missions team, and I'm going to help out uh, uh, Wes and Misty Peterson, and so keep that in mind, November the 10th, tonight's offering will be for World Missions, there are a couple of other announcements, so do make sure that you grab a bulletin, and, um, and, and this is going to be, oh, you know what, I had one other announcement I didn't mention, did I? Uh, the ladies Bible study, I don't really have um, all of the information for that, had some computer problems today, and, and we weren't able to get all that pulled up. Uh, but um, the ladies' Bible study that's been going on Tuesday, November. A new study, not Tuesday, a new study will start on November the 4th. And uh, so if you haven't been a part of that, um, join, join in, ladies, with this. And um, I know a lot of ladies, so several, have, have come to Nancy and told them how much this was a blessing uh, in their lives. And so if, if, if you're unsure, we'll try to make sure that Nancy's ready to give an announcement next Sunday. And that way she can uh, um, uh, give all the details necessary. Some of you may be... Uh, weren't here when it first got started, don't know exactly even what we're talking about, uh, but it's a really neat thing, I think. It's, it's not your typical traditional Bible study where everybody gathers together one day of the week. You kind of do it on your own time and then interact over the, on the Facebook page and things like that um, if you would like to do that. So, uh, ladies, just keep that in mind that the new study, uh, there will be a new study coming and it will start November the 4th, which may or may not be a Tuesday. Probably not, honestly, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Uh, the Bible has a lot to say about worship and about praise, and uh, there are so many different uh, so many different passages that we can read. Wednesday night we shared some of the passages about worship. We talked about what it meant. But one thing that's clear throughout all of the Bible is that worship is to be exuberant. I see passages in Scripture that say, "Clap your hands, all you people." I see passages in Scripture that say, "Praise Him with," and then it names off a whole list of instruments and ways that we can praise Him. And then I see things that 
passages of Scripture that say, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. So I get the picture when I read through those things that we're supposed to be exuberant. We're supposed to be happy. There should be a smile on our face. We should come intentionally ready to worship and celebrate our God and what He's done for us. So I hope that you're here and you're ready to do that this morning. Brother Terry's going to come and lead us in our singing. I think the first song, if I remember right, was Amazing Grace. Is that right? And it's so wonderful to praise God for His amazing, amazing grace. Let's stand and worship the Lord together this morning. Don't forget, next Sunday is our carry-in dinner. This is October's pastor appreciation, so we will be having a carry-in dinner in honor of our pastors next Sunday. Number 85. <laughs>
that, that we face, Lord, that we our focus is on what's going on instead of on the God who who can take care of what's going on. And uh, perhaps, uh, as we've heard it said before, we're, we're focusing on the mountain and we're thinking about how big the mountain is instead of thinking about how big our God is in, in light of this mountain that we're facing. Lord, I pray that you would forgive us for those times we've done that, those times that we failed to, to truly trust you fully and wholeheartedly. And Lord, would you help us to, to do that today? We bring these needs before you. You know the needs that are represented in here. I do want to mention specifically, Brother Walt, we're so glad that he's here today. We pray that you would continue to have your hand upon he and Sister Roseanne, Brother Albert, Brother Kenny Peterson, Brother Ken Peterson. We pray that you have your hand upon each of these uh, individuals. Lord, we, we're grateful for the blessing of marriage. We're so grateful for Pastor Brian, who is here ministering alongside us. He's doing such a wonderful job. He's such a blessing already to this body of believers. And we pray that you would bless he and Maria in a special way, especially in these days. I pray that you would help them to have a wonderful time on their honeymoon. Keep them safe. Protect them. And Lord, we pray that even now, from the very beginning, that you would bless their marriage. And Lord, make it a fruitful. Make it a blessing to the kingdom, their relationship together. And Lord, we pray that you would bless us as a, as a church, as we endeavor to do your will, as we endeavor to be the church and do what you've called us to do. Lord, we believe that you've you've given us a mission and that you've given us values that comprises who we are, who you've made us to be. Lord, we, we think it's important that we've put a special emphasis and focus on knowing you and on loving people and on serving others. And we pray that you would help each and every one of us to truly embrace that mission and espouse it as our own. Lord, that when we go out from the service and, and we're not necessarily here meeting together, we're still thinking about that mission and living it out in our own personal, individual lives. Lord, when we're working with our co-workers and, and when, we're, when we're talking to our neighbors and when we're just doing the things that we do as normal people, help us to always, somewhere, at least in the back of our minds, be thinking about knowing you fully and loving people serving others, and may that be our watchword and song in everything that we do. Lord, we thank you for your presence in the service here this morning, and we pray that you would help us to, uh, Lord, to have hearts that are open and receptive to the truth of your word, whatever it is that you have for us today. And Lord, we pray that your name would be lifted up and magnified in everything that's said and done, every song that's sung. In Jesus' precious name, amen. You may be seated. The choir's going to sing this time.
aren't you thankful for the presence of the Lord? I'm so grateful that He chooses to bless our gatherings with His presence. I, I've said it before myself, I was reading not, not all that long ago about using the passage that says that God inhabits the praises of His people. So if you want God's presence, you must praise. And actually, uh, that's not exactly scriptural uh, to say that. And also, if you think about it, it's not really consistent with what we already know, because he told us where two or three are gathered together in his name, there he is in the midst of them. If we've gathered, and we are drawing near to him, he's promised to draw near to us. He's promised to be there. And so he's here today. There's nothing that we can do, no, no, no sort of spirit that we can conjure up that would somehow ask him to come down, and, 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 and finally, if we do something right, then he'll be there. The right thing to do is to gather together in his name, and he'll be there. That's his promise. And I'm thankful for the peace that comes from His presence. It's not just in these services. His presence that continues with us as He helps us and guides us and gives us leadership. Helps us to know what to do in difficult uh, scenarios when perhaps we don't have all the answers. I'm grateful for His abiding presence. We're going to continue our worship this morning through our giving. And uh, let's, uh, let's worship as we give and, uh, and uh, make that a part of, of, of our worship this morning. Jeremy, would you ask the Lord's blessing on the offering? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence and glory felt this morning. We thank you for the day where we can come into your house and worship you. And we ask that as we give this offering back to you, that it brings glory and honor to your name, and to further your kingdom. We'll give you all the praise and glory. In our name we pray. Amen.
in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know.
that all of that matters to us today is primarily because of the foundational truths that came about in the Protestant Reformation, but also because if the changes that the Protestant Reformation brought about had not occurred those 500 years ago, over 500 years ago, there's a good chance that we possibly could be living the same miserable lives that the people of that day were living. We could, we could know nothing of the grace of God. We might have little to no understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we would probably be living with the same ignorance and poverty as the common people all those years ago. So at this time of the year, as we near the anniversary of the Protestant Reformation, we remember the life of a man named Martin Luther. But most importantly, we affirm the doctrinal truths that became the cause of the Protestant Reformation. In the middle of all the hopelessness and the darkness of what is of the Dark Ages aptly named, God raised up a man by the name of Martin Luther who would give the hearts and the minds of these miserable people hope, who would expose them to the truth and show them the Bible plan of salvation by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Martin Luther was an ordinary man a man who, in fact, we wouldn't even agree with on everything that he believed. Uh, not by a long shot. But he had a heart after God. And he had a passion to know Christ and to make him known to others, to the world around him. And God used him in a mighty way to turn the world around for Christ and to usher in a great revival of true, biblical Christianity. Were it not for men such as Martin Luther that through the years have been willing to stand on principles for what they know is right, regardless of personal danger, regardless of whether or not it was a losing battle, regardless uh, of whether or not they had to fight it all alone, who knows where we as the church would be today. But what really makes the message of a man like Martin Luther so great today is that the doctrinal issues that he stood for over 500 years ago, they're still the keystones of our faith and our practice. In a day when the church held absolute authority, Martin Luther proclaimed, it's not what the church dictates. It's not what the priest can do for me. It's not even what I can do for myself. It is faith alone, grace alone, scripture alone, Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. Those five tenets are part of what is known as Martin Luther's 95 Thesis, which he nailed to the door of the castle church in Witten. Germany. I've been there. I've seen those doors. I've stood in front of that church. And if I had a picture, I would have put it up there. Um, and uh, unfortunately, um, I don't have the pictures of it, of that trip. But we're going, he, he, he nailed these theses and he, and, and he started what's known as the Protestant Reformation. We're going to look at, at these tenets today and, and next Sunday, which is known as Reformation Sunday. But Scripture alone, that's the first one we're going to talk about. And 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us, all scripture, we have several texts today, is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Luther began to preach that the only authority in debates about church doctrine, about theology, the only authority was the Bible. He said that the Pope wasn't the authority, and neither was church tradition. And as you can imagine, the stand that Martin Luther was taking in the world of his time especially on this issue, drew the indignation of church leadership. He was summoned to answer for the things he was teaching, and the leadership demanded that he renounce his teachings. But with courage, Luther looked right in the eyes of the powerful cardinal, who was demanding that he renounce this heresy. And he refused to renounce his teaching of salvation by grace through faith, unless it could be proven that he was wrong through the Scriptures. He said that he would not take the Pope's word as the final authority. The Bible was the final authority. Amen. Only let my errors be proven by Scripture, and I will revoke my work and throw my books into the fire. That's what he said. Unless convinced by the testimony of Scripture or right reason, for I trust neither the Pope nor councils inasmuch as they have often erred and contradicted one another. I am bound by conscience, held captive by the Word of God and the Scriptures I have quoted. I neither can nor will recant anything. For it is neither right nor safe to act against conscience. Here I stand. God help me. Amen. Only the Bible, only God's Word has the final authority. Can you imagine a world where that was, that was a novel idea? That was a new thing that Martin Luther was standing for. It's something that we wholeheartedly affirm as a church. One of our core values is biblical authority. The 
the Bible was the final authority of Martin Luther's day. And the Bible is still the final authority today. When we stand before God, my opinion, your opinion, it's not going to matter. When we stand before God, it won't matter what we felt in our heart about a particular issue. It won't matter what some preacher or some psychologist or what some expert has to say about the things of life. What will matter then and what matters now is what does God's Word say about this particular issue. Right. We don't get to heaven by following our hearts. In fact, your heart is deceitfully wicked. Don't follow your heart. Don't listen to Disney. Don't do that. We don't get to heaven by, by following our heart. We don't get to heaven even by obeying the Bible, plus someone's personal notions of what might be right and what might be wrong. The Bible is our roadmap. The Bible is what we follow. Not some person's ideas. Not the ideas of a, of a popular preacher. Not the ideas of a good Christian writer. Not even the ideas and notions of a, of a, of a saint, of a person of God that we deeply respect. That's not how we get to heaven. The Word of God is what gives us direction, is what gives us stability, and it's the Word of God alone that can give us direction and stability. It's the Word of God alone that is a foundation for our lives. God's Word is the authoritative standard of truth. There is no other authoritative standard. The hymnist wrote, My heart is leaning on the Word, the written Word of God. Salvation by my Savior's name, salvation through His blood. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. And you find that right here in that truth and the reality of that in God's word. The question is, are we spending the time in the word that we should be? Do we know the Bible like we ought to know? We, we have numerous copies of the Bible. Many of you, raise your hand. You're not even sure how many copies of the Bible that you have. Same as me. But how often? We so often take it for granted. We forget. Maybe some never knew. That men have paid a great price to get the Bible in our language, in our hands. Some paid the ultimate price. They gave their lives. We take this book for granted far too often. We need to love this book. We need to read this book. Study this book. We need to know this book. It is the authoritative word of God to us. And great men such as Martin Luther gave their lives to the cause of spreading its truth. We believe in the authority of Scripture alone. Another of the five tenets of the Protestant Reformation is for the glory of God alone. 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. It's simple. Everything you do ought to bring God glory. Most of us could quote that in our sleep. It has almost maybe even become a cliche for many in the church. Everything you do is supposed to bring God glory. We get that. But how do you know if something you do is, is bringing God glory? How do you know? How can you make sure that, that you're eating to God's glory? How do you make sure that you're, you're, you're doing some sort of mundane, seemingly unnecessary task to, to, to God's glory? It's, it's a matter of how you live your life and, and your mindset. Rick Warren says, anything that causes you to love God more brings glory to God. Anything you do that causes you to trust God more brings glory to God. Anything you do that causes you to obey God, to love God, to serve God, anything that causes you to want to brag on God and tell unbelievers, look what he did for me, that brings glory to God. Make sure everything you do, down to the most mundane task, is wrapped up in a mindset of, of glory, bringing glory and honor to God. Another tenet is faith alone. Ephesians 2.8 tells us, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it's the gift of God. Martin Luther's spiritual journey was, it was an interesting one. As a young monk, Martin Luther, he lived in, in constant despair about his spiritual condition. He wanted to know for sure that, that he was at peace with God, that he was ready to face God in the judgment, but he just couldn't get over the feeling of feeling like, like he had to do something to earn his salvation. He just didn't feel worthy. And he lived in constant fear of the wrath of God in his life. He went to extreme measures to try to please God. He tried things like long, sleepless nights, spent agonizing over his spiritual condition. He would deny himself food. He would beat himself with a scourge until he would bleed. One writer said that if you saw Martin Luther in those days, you would have seen a young man that had fasted so many meals they had wasted away until you could count nearly every bone in his body. His eyes were sunken in. 
He carried himself dejectedly. His face was marked by lines of, of inward anxiety. His whole appearance was always grave and solemn. And, and all of this it was because he desperately wanted to please God. And yet he didn't know how. And so he tortured himself. And he put himself through all of these horrible things. And he was in so much turmoil. And he mistreated his body so badly that he almost killed himself over it. But one day, Martin Luther was serving as a professor at the University of Wittenberg, Germany, and he was studying his Bible. And he opened his Bible, and the words of Romans chapter 1, verse 17, captivated his attention. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And somehow that day, God showed Martin Luther that he wanted to give him life and not death. He wanted to give him forgiveness and not judgment. He wanted to save him and not punish him. And that day, Martin Luther realized that salvation is by faith and not by anything that anyone could do. Luther said that when this realization came over him, he felt completely reborn. As though he had entered paradise itself through its open portals. And Martin Luther began to preach the liberating message that salvation doesn't come through punishing your body. It doesn't come through performing good deeds. It doesn't come through having faith in God's grace. No, I'm sorry, it does. It doesn't come through good deeds. What it comes through is having faith in God's grace to forgive sins and to cleanse those sins from our hearts. We've heard that message so often and we've heard that truth preached so much that it's, I'm afraid that it's become humdrum and commonplace to us. But for these people, imagine if you were in this world with these people who have been bound by the cold, heavy chains of dry, meaningless rituals for these people that had no hope and no real understanding of who God is or what He's like. This was good news. Right. This changed everything. And let me tell you this morning that this message, the, the message that we're saved by faith and the reality that the just shall live by faith wasn't just good news for the people living in the dark ages. It's good news on this Sunday morning here in Fort Scott, Kansas. You could never, never be good enough to earn your way into heaven. In fact, the Bible tells us that all of the good things we do, our righteousness, it's like garbage. It's worthless. You could never do enough good things to, to build a stairway somehow to where God is. You could never deliver yourself from the chains of sin. But you don't have to. You're not saved by grace through your good works. You're not saved by grace through the things that you do. You're, you're not saved by grace through the money that you put in the offering plate. You're not saved by grace through your good conservative Christian standards, the way that you live your life. You're saved by grace through faith alone. Amen. Faith in Jesus Christ is the only condition of salvation. A right relationship with God and all the blessings of heaven. It means that at the moment a person possesses true faith in Jesus Christ, that person is saved. Regardless of whether, uh, uh, whether they have the presence of other Christian fruit in their lives. We'll close out today with, with one more of the five tenets of the Protestant Reformation. We're saved by grace through faith, grace alone. Martin Luther came to understand that the just shall live by faith. And it was sometime shortly after this that Pope Leo X decided that he wanted to build a new cathedral, a new beautiful church building in what is now St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. So Leo devised a scheme to raise the money for this elaborate cathedral that he wanted to build. It was a man named Johann Tetzel. He was commissioned to sell indulgences from the Roman Catholic Church. And in a nutshell, an indulgence was a piece of paper that people could buy that gave them complete forgiveness for sin. You could buy one for yourself. You could buy one so that the sins of your dead mother or grandfather or uncle or whoever could be forgiven and they could escape purgatory. And uh, one of the little jingles that Tetzel used to sell his indulgences, I'm not sure what the tune of it was, but he, the words were, when a coin in a coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. And they would do this jingle, and he began a campaign, and people would begin to give. And this is how they were raising money to build this ornate, elaborate cathedral. Just imagine that we had a table set up in the foyer of the church, and, and uh, maybe we were having a big, a big new building project on the inside, and that'd be great, but that's not how we're going to raise our funds. But imagine that it was... And, and if you did something wrong, you could just walk up to the table, you could buy a piece of paper, sign your name on it, walk away knowing that your sin is forgiven. And all is good, and, and I'm right, and, 
That's basically the idea of an indulgence. Except for those people would walk away, and the reality is there, there still wouldn't be that peace. They would think they would be deceived. They would think they're doing that, but there was that missing peace. And Tetsa would roll into town. They would make a speech, and the people would line up to buy these pieces of paper, thinking that they were buying their spiritual freedom or buying spiritual freedom for their dead loved ones. We who know so much today in, in the fact that we have God's Word in our language and we've grown up hearing it taught and reading it, we think that sounds kind of crazy. We wouldn't ever buy into something like that. But these people had been in such darkness that they had no way of knowing anything different. The, God's Word wasn't even in their language. They didn't know any different than what the church told them to believe. And they blindly followed their religious leaders. And the sale of these indulgences is really the catalyst, actually, that prompted Martin Luther to write his 95 protest points against the sale of indulgences. And the protest has gone down in history as the 95 Theses. Luther's plan was to write these protests and place them on the community bulletin board, which just so happened to be the front door of the Castle Church in Wittenberg, Germany. It was not unusual for people to post announcements and bulletins on the church door. And as Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses uh, on, that, on the door of that church, October 31st, 1517, as I understand from my studies, he really wasn't doing it in a spirit of defiance. It was a spirit of humility. It wasn't like it was a clean, pristine church door and, and he just comes up and nails something in the middle of it uh, uh, as, a, as a statement. He simply thought, that it would encourage discussion about the problem of indulgences. And he was, he was saying, these are the things that I found in my study of God's Word, and I think we ought to talk about these things. But somebody took that, printed numerous copies of this writing, and spread it all across Germany. It was probably somebody who was led of the Lord to do that. And it wasn't very long at all before the whole nation was abuzz with discussion about what Luther had written. Martin Luther had taken a stand for the truth of the Bible. He said the Pope cannot remove anyone's guilt of their sin. He cannot confirm what God has forgiven. Uh, he can't only confirm. He can't do it himself. It's, that's only God's job. And that's a wonderful reality for us this morning. We don't have to buy indulgence from somebody to be forgiven of our sins. We don't have to go before some earthly priest or anybody down here on earth and confess our sins and wait for him to say, I absolve you of your sins. We don't have to wait for that. We're saved. We're not saved through confession to a priest. We're saved by the grace of God. And we don't need an earthly priest to, to approach God on our behalf. No. We've been invited to approach the great high priest for ourselves. And, and, and he will take our prayers to God the Father on our behalf. Hebrews chapter 4 verses 14 to 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who was tempted in every way that we are, yet was without sin. No other priest can say that. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence. Notice it doesn't say, let us then approach the confessional booth with confidence. So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. God extended His love and mercy to us. It was completely undeserved, but He extended His grace. He gave us the desire to know Him. And He paved the way so that we could come to Him and find forgiveness for our sins. When I could not come to where He was, He came to me. Thank God for His grace. Thank God for the truth, these tenets that we've looked at today. Thank God for giving us His Word. This love letter to us, that's so much more than just a trite thing we say. A loving God knew what it would take for us to be justified before Him as a holy God and make our way to heaven. And He lovingly directed men to pen down these words for us so that we can follow this roadmap and make it. This Bible is the absolute authority, the absolute standard of truth in a world where everybody is shaking and rocking and, and looking for, for this sort of identification or, or this sort of truth. I heard, I saw a billboard recently the other day and it said, this is my truth. You hear people talking about my truth. Truth is truth. If we all have our own truth, then there's nothing to stand on. And I'm here to tell you in a floundering world that there is an absolute standard of truth that we can stand on. But we must actually stand on it. We must actually endeavor to build our lives on obedience and careful following of God's Word to us. And it's through God's Word that we find out all of these other things that we've talked about today. That salvation is 
by faith alone, by grace alone only. It's only by God's grace, it's only through faith in His finished work on the cross that we're able to have salvation, that we can stand before a holy God one day and hear, well done, now good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joys of the Lord. Thank you for your attention today. I'm so grateful for God's grace and mercy in these truths. We're going to talk about one more truth, a powerful truth, next Sunday. And we'll see you next Sunday.